just to say that if you want to use the Wi-Fi here, it's Studio 3, and it's Big L, let me chat, all one word. The hashtag for today is Fashion Brexit PT, which is pretty all around here. You can just check it. Um, thank you very much for all coming over to West London to the Sunbeam Studios, who have kindly hosted us this evening. Um, Lisa has got stuck at Westminster, who's um, the chair of the all-party group for Textiles and Fashion, which we're the secretariat, but everyone else here is ready to answer your questions. We've got Catherine Hamnett, CBE, well-known designer and activist. We've got Professor Swati Dingra from the London School of Economics. He's our economics expert at the Fashion Lab table. We have Harry Prabhu, who is, what's your role at? Um, <laughs> policy and Events. Thank you, Policy and Events Officer at the Creative Industries Federation, which we are members of at Fashion Lab table. Alison Cole, who is Senior Trademark Attorney at New Deal Intellectual Property, I got it right. <laughs> and um, Dr. Simon Usherwood, who is Deputy Director at UK and a Changing Europe, who are a fantastic think tank um, who work a lot at the moment around Brexit policy, but also around what's going on with all of the EU-UK negotiations. Um, and um, Nav, who's a member of the team there, is our UK policy expert. And their, their events, such as their annual um, Brexit conferences, which are always on the 29th of March, are well worth going to, just to keep updated on all the facts. So we're going to just start with a keynote speech from Catherine. Um, I, I think, well, let's see what, what you want to say. Let's go. Well, hello, is this working? Yes, yeah. good. Okay, so, to kick off, um, fashion Brexit question time. Well, question time is kind of um, quite appropriate because how the fuck are we in this situation to start off with? <laughs> um, we should never have had a referendum. Um, they should have actually looked at the situation, how Northern Ireland is insoluble. There's just no way that we can keep the single market without having a hard border between Northern Ireland and Southern Ireland. And so the referendum should never have happened, but it did. Well, Brexit, you know, for fashion, the fashion is, um, industry is a complete disaster. Um, the Fashion Roundtable poll of, I think, 96%, was it, of industry leaders and entrepreneurs polled that if they had a uh, vote tomorrow, they'd vote remain. 80% of the industry polled thinks that, fashion, uh, that Brexit is going to be bad for fashion. Um, and that's putting it mildly. I mean, you know, look at the, you know, it's a complete catastrophe for the UK. Um, the fashion industry is actually kind of somehow, for some reason, I mean, the reason, one of the reasons I joined Fashion Roundtable is it's the first time I've seen anything that's actually integrated with British government. The fashion industry actually um, generates 35 odd billion for the exchequer, and we never hear a squeak about it, although we hear a lot about fisheries, which are very worthy, but they only represent 1.9 billion. Um, the fashion industry employs 890,000 individuals. There's a resurgence in British manufacturing. I mean, one of the saddest things is that there's a new EU-Japan trade deal, uh, which is free, free trade between EU, you know, across the EU and Britain leaving the EU is not going to be eligible to be part of that group, and that would be um, 670 million of the richest consumers in the world, the biggest uptakers for fashion, 23 miles away across the channel. What is the hate about that? It's just devastating. Um, do you identify as a European? How do you see? Well, I mean, I was, I'm a hybrid. I was brought up in Europe. My father was in the Air Force. He used to sell. The, you know, used to basically represent the British military and the British arms industry um, all over Europe. But in that process, we lived in France, we lived in Romania, um, we lived in Stockholm. Um, I was educated here. Um, I speak French, um, reasonable Italian, terrible Spanish, but I can just about hack it if I'd had a couple of drinks. Um, and I'm just heartbroken. I may also look at the European view on Brexit, which is actually largely misrepresented by the British press. The Europeans are, are heartbroken that we want to leave. They're devastated. They you'd realize that you know we're one of the largest economies in the 27 countries. So us leaving the EU is going to have massive 
negative economic impact on the rest of Europe. You know, I can't believe that we didn't use, you know, the threat we might leave to actually negotiate. We could have actually reformed Europe by saying, well, we might leave, you know, unless you reform the common agricultural policy, or we might leave, you know, and, you know, how about making it more dem democratic? How about looking at corruption in EU funding, where, you know, you can see, you know, we've got a place in Spain, and there was a five million euro grant for round, roundabout building. And so if you're sort of flying into Mallorca and I can see Inca, which is this, uh, this sort of slightly industrial town in the center, and it's so ringed with roundabouts, it looks like a pearl necklace. You've never <laughs> seen so many roundabouts anywhere. We could, have, we could have actually negotiated instead of this sort of omelet approach that Theresa May's done. We could have proper negotiation. We could have reformed Europe from within. Um, we haven't done it. Um, how do we vote at, the, vote at the European elections? This is something I think that we should talk about because I'm not clear. Um, we could blackmail Labour to say, well, look, if you include a second referendum, you know, on your policy, well, then we'll all vote for you. And then we just have a single block vote, which would be for Labour MPs, which would be the easiest way to beat the Brexit party. Um, but it's also up in the air. I mean, I've seen the questions and we don't know any answers to anything. We don't know what tariff we're going to be charged for goods coming into Europe, what tariff we're going to pay for our goods going into Europe. You know, Europe is our biggest trading partner way beyond America. Um, and I think, you know, I've ranted enough now. I'd like to open it up to everybody else and stop hogging the microphone. <laughs> <laughs> You're sharing, and then we're going to give the. <laughs> no, she's not being rude. If you could take the handheld one, which is the one on what is wet now, because we're going to go around for questions. So, um, just just before we start the questions, starting with Simon, do you just think we, you could give us a roundup of where we're at, because and, and just pick up on any any points you want to make about that, and then if we could just quickly just do that, and then we'll go into the questions. So I did look at question time this morning just to um, familiarize myself with the new Fiona incarnation of question time, and it was quite heated last week. So um, I hope we don't get quite so heated. Uh, I don't think she dealt with some of it very well, but um, we'll, we'll do our best. Okay. But if you just want to give a roundup of where you think we're at at the moment. Okay, uh, the simple and short answer to where we are with Brexit is uh, we are where we've been for the last five months, which is that we have uh, an agreement that's been negotiated between the UK and the EU, and we're now trying to decide what we're going to do with that, whether the UK is going to ratify that uh, and leave with a deal, whether it's going to not ratify that and leave without a deal, or it's going to change its mind and not leave at all. Those are the three options. They've been the three options uh, since the start of this process, and that's always been clear. Uh, what's equally clear is that none of those options commands anything like a majority in Parliament at the moment. Uh, and so we end up with a, a fourth uh, path, which has been extension. Uh, a bit more time to hope that something works itself out. Maybe someone's got a bright idea. Maybe somebody here tonight can unlock Brexit. Uh, and that's about the, the situation that we're in. But really, the options are clear. None of them are without problems, none of them are without costs, and uh, we have to make a decision about which one of those we do, because extensions, uh, whilst they have been given so far, uh, are not automatically going to come down the line. But at some point, the EU will say, this is um, a ridiculous situation. At some point, someone in the UK will say, this is a ridiculous situation uh, for large reason that it's a ridiculous situation. And uh, at some point we will end up with this uh, coming to a juddering halt. So in terms of where we are, we, we all had an Easter break, uh, commentators, politicians, journalists, uh, and then we've come back to discover that everything is exactly the same. So to, to use the deathless words of Theresa May, nothing has changed. <laughs> and uh, nothing will change. Uh, and I think during the course of the, uh, the debate that we're going to have, I think we're, we'll see some of the issues. And just maybe one point to clarify, we're going to be quite unhelpful in some of our answers because a lot of the questions uh, that you've asked are, what's going to happen? Uh, and the genuine answer is we don't know. 
Uh, and the reason for that is that the withdrawal agreement... Oh, okay. the, the, the withdrawal agreement is only one part of the Brexit process. <laughs> Hi, Jefferson. <laughs> so, <I'm laughs> someone's aggravated by the by Brexit. So the withdrawal <laughs> agreement is only about the UK leaving the EU. It's about ending the old relationship. It's not about the future relationship. Uh, and you'll be really happy to know that leaving the EU, the bit that we've done, was the easy bit. Because it was a very limited agenda, it was very clear what uh, the process and procedure was, uh, the uh, options were relatively limited. <coughs> the future relationship is much more complicated and will take much more time. So what do you do with that when uh, I, I think, I think people have faced, um, have got saturated and have got sick of it, what do you do with the emotional reaction of people who, uh, I know that, I know that we're just at the beginning of the beginning of the beginning, but, people, but I don't think that's been grasped. I think that they, they think that this is all going to go away and we can move on to other issues because this kicking down the can is very similar to the climate change issues. So, the, so it's a similar approach, which is having similar results. And people's emotional responses to Brexit have got saturated. You know, I was telling you how many baked bean tins I've bought. I don't even like baked beans. But you know, that's not even the beginning of dealing with what we're dealing with. And I think maybe the, the, the more hopeful message from this is that all of the debate that we have, all of the anger, the passion, the emotion, a, a lot of that will die down. But there will still be important decisions to be made. Mm. And those are decisions that will impact on you and will affect your work, your personal lives, uh, every aspect of what you do. So. The thing to keep in mind is there's still lots of decisions to be made, and uh, if you want to shape those decisions, the more you persist, the more you keep involved in political debates, in commercial debates, in uh, engaging with uh, different uh, audiences and people, the more chance you have of having your voice heard, because there will be other people who will give up and let other people make decisions for them. Yeah. So a basic truism of politics is if you don't make decisions or try to make decisions, other people will make decisions for you. Uh, and as a general rule, other people don't make as good decisions for you <laughs> as you make for yourself. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. And then um, if there anything else you want to add on the current landscape? Yes. Um, I come from a slightly different standpoint, which is the legal perspective. There is law in place that says when Brexit happens, it will be situation normal. All laws will be passed from all the EU laws to the UK laws, until or unless they are changed by the government, which will no longer be governed by the Europeans. They might be guided by it, they might take notes, they might not. So that's the general overview. And then in my specific area, which is intellectual property, the big problem we have individuals, small businesses, is that for 20 years we've been telling everyone, get an EU trademark, get an EU registered design, cover the whole EU in one convenient, efficient, cost-effective route, and that's not going to be the case anymore. So there are changes, they're relatively small, but there's the hassle factor, and then there's a duplication of cost, um, and there's the possibility for missing out on things if you're not getting the proper advice. Um, so it was one unitary right that covered the EU. It's now going to require the EU and the UK to agree, big word, on not only how they separate it, but then how they run side by side and coexist and overlap going forward. So you might think that as a lawyer, we relish this, thinking, great, lots of grey area, lots of fees. No, I like being able to give my clients precise and unambiguous advice. And at the moment, I can't do that. Mm -hmm. um, but that's, that's where we are from an IP perspective. And then, Harry, in terms of the kind of the whole, of the bigger landscape for all of the creative industries, I know fashion's the largest component mm. of that financially, but uh, the messages that I heard when I was working in Parliament was like, oh, that's like opera singers, that's right. like uh, musicians, there's the kind of the freedom of movement. Um, is there anything that you've seen at the moment which has um, 
force people's thinking? Are you? Are you? Yeah. He's mic'd up. Don't worry, Scotty. <laughs> So the, yeah, yeah, I mean, where do you think the landscape is in that uncertainty um, for campaigns such as we're part of, which is Free Move mm -hmm. Create, which is about freedom of movement for creatives? Do you think that there's been a sense of um, understanding of that from the government? Mm -hmm. I mean, I definitely feel there's a real desire from, um, say, the Department for Culture and Media and, and, and Sport to deal with this issue. Um, the problem is them convincing the Home Office on our behalf that this is what we need. And it, and it really is because as a wider creative industries is a very product performance based sector. Temporary movement is so essential for us. You know, uh, you've mentioned opera. So often I think the Association of British Orchestras say they bring people on a daily basis because suddenly we'll, someone will drop out and they'll need a replacement very, very quickly. Um, but then you look at something like film where you can have a very form, small film studio, maybe one to three people. Uh, but you start a project, you need to get visual effects specialists in for post-production, and that's a longer term, three months or so. So it is absolutely essential that we find the long-term mobility solution. But the tricky thing is, this can only really begin once we've exited the EU. Um, as Simon was saying, that um, we can't begin on negotiating this future relationship until we've actually exited. And that's where I get very pessimistic, unfortunately, these days. It just seems that the politics has become intractable. Uh, you look at Labour unwilling to compromise on a customs union versus the Conservatives on a customs arrangement, I mean, whatever the difference yeah, is there. I've never really understood the difference between the two, and yet it's become this wide hmm. breach, hasn't it? Yeah. I read her deal, and it read like a customs union. It seems almost the same, apart from actually saying it is <laughs> a customs union, but the problem is, you know, how do you negotiate that balance of trying to maximize trade with our, our biggest trading partners while at the same time making this whole thing somewhat worthwhile. I mean, if we end up staying in the customs union, it's hugely beneficial, but then what would we have bothered leaving for at all in the first place? And and I think culturally there's a lot of pressure on politicians now in the way in which this has become a very identity politics issue mm. in that um, it doesn't seem to be about exiting the European Union anymore, about the institutions, about the consequences economically, politically. It's simply about how you feel about Britishness, Europeanness, and yeah, I think that it matters in terms of you know how you relate to sovereignty and how you want to show your sovereignty, but it doesn't matter as much as the direct consequences. I think we really need to start getting back to the integrity of it. Mm, agreed. Uh, Scotty, <coughs> so I'll talk about the economics of it all. Um, the main point is any trade agreement you sign, you have to give up some amount of national sovereignty. That just goes with it. You don't sit and make laws together without giving up some level of sovereignty. So, of course, all of this is going to come at some kind of breakaway. Okay, you might regain some national sovereignty, but the question is at what cost? And typically, most economists here agree very much unanimously that we think there's going to be a negative impact. Overall, how much that negative impact is going to be, of course, will depend on the kind of deal that's negotiated afterwards. But broadly, if you wanted to start looking at the economy already, if you didn't believe any of us and you thought all of us were anyway idiots because we couldn't predict the financial crisis, so why should you listen to us now? Then the one thing I can tell you is the facts that have come in since 2016, since the vote happened, all point in exactly the direction that we kept talking about, which is that the exchange rate's massively taken a hit typically a sign of less confidence within the country. If you look at GDP per hour worked here, which has always anywhere lagged behind, say, countries like Germany, the US, or France, that's even fallen further behind since the votes happened. Intermediate import prices, so, you know, car components that you import from abroad to be able to make cars in Sunderland, those have gone up. For this particular industry, if you were, say, thinking of what happened to prices of clothing, they've gone up about 4.5% since the referendums happened. So all of these things are starting to put pressure to the point where real wages in this country, since pretty much after the financial crisis, when they started to you know, look like they were recovering, have gone back to falling again. And that's really where we are at right now, and that's really what the sort of state, economic stake here is. Mm. Thank you. All right, Amy. Amy, are you here? Amy? No. So I'm going to read out her question because I realised oh, why we cornered everybody and then I was like, where's Amy? <laughs> so I'm Catherine because Lisa's not here and it's actually to do with, uh, no, actually no, I'm going to go, do you think you could answer question five? Yes. Yeah, fine. So Alison is going to answer Amy's question and Amy's not <laughs> here. Um, what do the panellists envision the government will do to protect 
the Made in Britain Fashion SMEs, which is small to medium-sized enterprises, that will be hit hardest by the impact of Brexit along with their supply chains. Why does film, and not fashion, get tax relief in the UK? Okay, so I can't answer the bits about tax relief. Um, but you might be my experience though. so far is that the government won't do anything to make it easier for SMEs. They make it harder. They make it more expensive to protect yourself. Um, if you already own an EU trademark, you will be granted what's going to be called a comparable right in the UK. So it'll be split off from your EU trademark. There won't be any official fees, but you can guarantee that firms will charge something because they've got to cover the liability of them being responsible for not only your UK right, but your EU right. So that's an extra cost, an extra charge to anybody who already owns a trademark. If you're already protected, you've still got to pay extra. Then you've got to pay extra because you've got to renew both of them if you're still interested in the UK and the EU trade. If you haven't got protection in both, you've now got a far protection in both. Mm. So the EU won't be any cheaper than it was just because it doesn't cover the UK anymore. Mm. You're going to have to cover the UK and the EU. And a very, very rough um, ballpark figure is that an EU trademark would be roughly £1,300 to file, and a UK would be £450. So you're looking now having to pay that extra four fifty because the 1300 used to cover the UK. Um, you've then got to um, take each application through and make sure it complies with the relative the development laws in the UK or the EU. Now, at the moment, they're harmonised. They are, should be the same, should be applied the same, but as I said, the governments in the EU organisations and the UK government can take those in very different directions. So you'll end up not knowing what you can protect when. Um, so if we were in a customs union, we'd have yeah. to stay more in line than if we weren't in a customs union. Yeah, so the EU trademark covers the EU, not the EEA, but mm. um, there are specific examples um, where EEA attorneys can trade in the EU. Um, yeah, it, it's just going to get... So, but if we were in a customs union, there would certainly be more leverage for UK attorneys to be able to say, I need to be able to practice at the EU level, which at the moment I won't be able to. Okay. So, Harry, the question about why does film and not fashion get tax relief? I know mm -hmm. classical music also does, but popular okay. music doesn't. Um, do you? I, I've had a chat with DCMS about this because it's something I feel quite passionately mm -hmm. about. Um, do you think there's any leverage for the fashion industry to get that kind of tax relief? I mean, I think there's definitely potential. I think the problem so far has been perception, which is a problem more widely in the creative industry, is still this idea that we're a soft uh, sector compared to you know, oil or finance when we're bigger than a lot of them combined. Our current GVA is 101.5 billion, I think, at the, the last estimate. Um, and it's really trying to push that message through. Film, I guess, has been thought of more as more of a hard industry than others within the creative industries and perhaps that's why hard camera and the EU a part of part of the reason is because of the EU structures that have been put in place. So the tax relief is partly for co productions. So things that are defined with you know, participants from different EU countries working together and they get tax relief on eighty percent of their spending for their production. So I imagine that um, if more is said um, on you know the financial benefits fashion is providing the economic strength that then that can help leverage it to get it to the similar status of film or music. So there's a potential lobbying aspect towards trying to encourage business within the U UK post-Brexit mm -hmm. if we could leverage that as an attractor. I think absolutely. Because yeah. the concern that I feel from what you've just said, Alison, is that if I have to spend 1350 for EU and 450 for UK, okay, I might find that. But if it carries on being like that, then why would I stay here? I know we're going to come yes. to that, but I mean, that's something that I think a lot of people are concerned about. Yeah, and that's only a small area. You extrapolate that to every area of your business. Yeah. Which once you just did on an EU level and now you've got to do separately. And plus, if the price of everything goes yeah. up. Yeah. Right. So, um, Patrick's got a question. Uh, Past, Pat, he's in suffragette colours, which is fantastic, um, and he's a designer who's, um, uh, you're one of the, uh, what would I say, the new leading sustainable fashion designers in the UK? Um, yeah, so I was a very new designer with, um, kind of coming into this as this all started, and I know you kind of covered this slightly already, but um, what will the implications be for UK-based particularly startup brands and designers, especially those which aim to be sustainable um, across their supply chains and the ethos in terms of IP and trademark. So 
how much more will it cost? I know you kind of touched on that slightly, but what do I need to do to kind of protect myself, mm. whose whole business is founded around sustainability and the kind of cross-European conversation that's happening around that right now? Yeah. What do I do when I'm taken out of the so, so we're going to start with Alison and then I want Swati to pick up on this a bit as well. Okay. So yes, you're right, I've covered some of that. Um, Thanks. The same, the trademarks is the same for registered community design. Um, unregistered designs are a bit more complicated and if anyone's got a specific question I'll come to that afterwards. But protecting yourself is still key. Um, unfortunately it's going to be more expensive. But if you've got a claim to anything that's original or creative, then you need to have that recognised. And really, a registered right is the best way to do it. There are three main reasons for that. As a deterrent, in order to let you exploit it, and in order to enforce it. So if you've got something registered, it's going to deter the lazy people from copying. People are lazy, people copy, there's no getting away from that. But if you've got something there that you can hold up as a weapon, uh, as a deterrent, if they see you've got protection, then a lot of people will walk away. If you want to exploit it, and that's in terms of um, selling it at a later date or licensing it. So the question actually referred to um, your own name, and I'm sure a lot of you trade under your own name. Now, in theory, no one can stop you as long as it's genuinely your name, you can use it, even if it happens to be the same as someone else's. What you can't do is change your name. There was a case somebody changed their name to Harrods. Harrods didn't like it. genuinely named, that's fine. What you would have think about though is if you sell that business, and Joe Malone is the key example, yeah. she sold her name to Estee Lauder, so she now can't trade as Joe Malone. She can still be called Joe Malone, but she can't trade. So now she tra trades as Joe Loves. So that's the kind of thing when you're starting out, is really key to think about. What do you want to keep ownership of? What, do you, what are you willing to let go of? And then the final thing is enforcement, and again, it's going to be more difficult, more expensive when you've got to do it separately, UK, to being able to do the whole EU. But that's everything from counterfeits to social media takedowns to domain names to um, people using a similar brand. All of that, if you've got your, your rights recognised and protected, it's a lot easier and ultimately is cheaper than having to fight them based on anything unregistered. So, right, so it's better to register and pay now rather than be yeah. caught in legal yeah. fight. And sorry, just one thing about uh, talking about the supply chains. LVMH have recently invested hugely in blockchain, and I, I see that as the big future for transparency, uh, for anything to do with IP and creativity. If you can track where it's come from without any argument, then in an ideal world that means that uh, counterfeit stops. So what is blockchain? Just to I I kind of get it and I never kind of no, get it. No, really it's, it's it's like um, a massive. It's like it's kind of like Wikipedia in the sense of um, anyone can contribute to it. But right. unlike Wikipedia, um, it has to be true, and it can be once it's in there, it can't be. <laughs> uh, once it's there, it can't be changed. So it, it, there's there's a lot of development, a lot of um, changes that need to go on to regulate it to make it work. Um, but you can use it, which I think is more important than why it works, how it works. You can use it to track the provenance of everything. Right. Okay. Um, so, in terms of how much more this might cost, Scotty, what do you what do you think? Because obviously, there's the cost implications. What what worries me more is not just the thirteen fifty and the four fifty. Is um, if we deviate and we end up in a chlorinated chicken universe where we're doing that kind of trade and then we're trying to compete with, as a sustainable brand with, with a kind of potentially glowing Scandinavian and European market, then what does a brand such as Patrick's do when the brand Britain's slightly been tarnished by... You know, it, it, that's, the, that's the kind of leverage that I think that hasn't been mentioned is that soft power of British fashion and of reputation that is, if we deviate from where the EU is going, the cost implication, not only is it the supply chain costs which we've covered, but I just wonder what it does to the brand of British fashion. Do you, I mean, is, is that the unanswerable question, Swati? I just basically that's, that's, that's like the nightmare question which you know you can never measure. Right, okay. <laughs> so beyond the sort of stuff that we can measure, which is things like you should already anticipate. I mean the exchange rate has rebounded some, 
but broadly it's still much below the level it used to be. So your, yeah. anything you buy from abroad, which means that this particular industry, about 75% of the components are coming from abroad, that is going to be more expensive. That's not even counting all the trade costs that are going to come on afterwards. And now those could be things like every little step you can imagine. The UK government has already sort of put out what the tariff schedule would look like if there's a no deal Brexit and they sort of have to go back right to the WTO norms. You know, clothing is not the one that's going to be spared. It's going to be something like cheddar cheese or, you know, something like some food item. It's not going to be, clothing is not going to be the first one on that list, and which it isn't at the moment already. The second problem with that is you might say, okay, well, the tariff part I can understand, I can understand all of these other things, but remember, it's not just about tariffs. It's about these hidden trade costs which you haven't anticipated, which is things like not only that your clothing has to be made in Britain, but it has to be made up to a certain degree. That's what most trade agreements are about, which is what is going to be the rules of origin that we're going to see. And then beyond that, I mean, I don't mean to actually have a complete, like, just make it seem all doomsday here. But yes, then add to that also the fact that people can't move about, all those, you know, intra-company transfers that you might be thinking of, or getting somebody from Milan to come over for a few days. That is going to be more problematic unless there is a new trade agreement in place which gives you roughly as much market access, which as at best we know that any trade agreement like that exists is of course first the European Union membership itself and after that is going to be something like EEA. But even there, there are potential risks of duties being slapped on, which has happened before to Norway. So all of those things, those cost pressures are going to build up and at least from the data that we can see of companies all across the UK, that is already happening. Can I just add? Um, I think the tragedy is that we produce some of the best fashion designers in the world because of our culture. We have the dressing up box, which unbelievably nobody else in Europe has, and we have our fashion education starts incredibly young. We play with roles because, you know, we're dressing up as princes and kings and baddies and cowboys and Indians and you name it. Um, characters we've seen on television. And this is what clothes are about. Clothes are about kind of cultural appropriation of roles. You know, we dress up, we dress up to be perceived as who we'd like to be perceived at. Anyway, we're geniuses at it. Um, we're streets ahead. If you look behind all the biggest fashion brands in the world, you'll find English designers there. So, you know, that's not going to go away, but your life has been made considerably harder. I mean, my, so one of the reasons, I think, for my success in the 80s is that I realized that the Brits a great, I love them, but they'll wear the same clothes for years and years and years, whereas Europeans have to have new out, completely new wardrobe every season. So you've got to be selling into Europe. You've got to be selling, you know, overseas. The big marketplace is Paris. Mm. You know, even if you're making in the, you know, the UK, and you're making the UK, and this is not to be not, because Asia, Japan, regards made in Britain as a supreme market quality. And I'm, we had a chat earlier, and I know you're doing menswear, mess jackets, you know, you're completely, you know, on stream for, you know, international success. But you need to present your wares overseas. You need to do the European trade fairs, you know, Paris is the big one. Um, and okay, it's gonna be 10% more expensive, you know, God knows what the currency probably crash if we go, um, if Brexit goes ahead, and so, you know, it's going to be 15% more expensive or whatever, but you've got to concentrate on the way that you promote your goods, you've got to have the best imagery, you've got to have all the social media, you've got to have the glamorous people wearing your stuff for nothing, you have to work on that side, the marketing side, because we're never going to lose the fact that British designers are some of the best in the world, or we probably are the best in the world, and you're one of them, so you can't give up but, you know, it's choppy sea ahead, so you've got to head out there into Europe and, you know, fuck Brexit. You know, your stuff is just going to be slightly more expensive than it would have been before. And you're just going to have to survive with that. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Catherine. Right, we're going to go on to the questions from Sweet Pea. And the first set of questions, which are going to go to Simon first, are from Nico. Um, um, do you want to read them out, Nico? Yep. So obviously you've covered some of it already, but we'll just stick with the script. <laughs> um, so Sweet Pea um, sells 
its brand to European stores and also exhibits at parish trade shows twice a year. So we'd like to know a bit more about the following areas, which you probably won't be able to answer. <laughs> um, so things like, um, will we need to have a car name to take our samples to the show? Um, will our staff require permission or a license to work at the show because it's in Paris? Um, will we need to require some sort of import license? And also, you know, how the tariffs for goods are affected, but again, you probably aren't going to be able to answer. And then the second question was um, that we do employ staff from the EU, and we'd like to know how their right to remain in and work will be affected. Thank you, Nico. Okay, uh, I'll, I'll try and say something a bit more useful than I don't know. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. Uh, the, the, the second answer is the academic answer, which it, it, it depends. Uh, <laughs> the reason it depends is because a lot of these things haven't been decided, and it, it partly depends on how the UK is leaving the EU. So if we end up with the uh, Parliament accepting the withdrawal agreement, then actually, in the first instance, nothing changes. So that we continue with EU rules as they are across the board, so actually you don't see any change whatsoever. But I think what we're all concerned about is a situation where the UK leaves without a deal. Now, in, in that situation, most of these things fall back towards just the, the wildness of the international system, uh, which means uh, whatever is in place for the WCO, but which only covers certain aspects, uh, and whatever other international So when, when Brexiteers talk about, well, we'll just go to WTO, it will all be great, and then Remainers say, no, it won't, it will be a disaster. For the layperson, who doesn't really understand and has never read up, understandably, on World Trade Organization um, information and tariffs. What does that, in layman's terms, kind of, what is that landscape like? Because I've heard it's like a 40% hike in costs. Is that about right? Well, well the first thing is the World Trade Organization deals with trade right. in a very narrow way. So it's, uh, it's very limited experience. So it's in no way equivalent to the EU in terms of what it does. The EU covers every aspect of your business. Uh, so the WTO makes no provision about rights to work, uh, you know, employing EU nationals. None of that will be covered by the WTO provisions. So it's very much more about uh, tariffs, about quotas, uh, there's some elements of intellectual property in there. Some elements of services, but it's a much more constrained aspect. So it depends very much what you're measuring. Uh, and actually, the things that are likely to cost you a lot more, such as your staff base, uh, you know, a big part of your costs are going to be staffing, that isn't going to be helped at all by being on WTO terms because there's no provision. What we do know is that the UK government has made some commitments that in the absence of a deal, there would be uh, an extension of uh, rights for EU uh, citizens. Uh, there's the second status program. But at some point, that will be replaced by a new uh, immigration and, uh, yeah. uh, system. But the government hasn't yet said what that will be. We have some reports from uh, the Immigration Advisory Committee. Yeah. Uh, but I noticed that, that so the, the MAC report recommended 30,000, but the government didn't pick up on that. So do you, do you know it, what's going on with that? Because yes, they're still disagreeing with each other. They're disagreeing with each other. This is the problem, is that as much as the government is consumed, the Parliament is consumed with trying to decide what to do about Brexit, there are a lot of other knock-on issues that are not narrowly about the withdrawal agreement and what we do, but which also clearly have big uh, economic uh, and social impacts. So the, the new migration system that we would have, which would remove the distinction between the EU and non-EU nationals uh, coming to the UK working, remains up in the air. Mm. And at that point, it makes it very hard. And I think one of the issues that we already see is that we see EU nationals concerned about the situation because there is uncertainty, and that rather than suddenly find themselves in an uncomfortable situation, you find themselves moving back to the rest of the EU, moving elsewhere, uh, or changing their status uh, in other kinds of ways. So you're already dealing and have been dealing with those impacts for the past couple of years. Uh, but until the government makes some decisions, 
And frankly, even when the government does make some decisions, you have the uncertainty that a new government can always unmake those decisions or remake them. You're going to end up in a situation where you have a, a much higher level of uncertainty. And I think that the general feature that you're uh, going to encounter as businesses is that uncertainty across the board is going to be that much higher because you're going to lose the set of entanglements from EU membership that you've had previously that have meant you've had a bit more sustainability in the process because the EU is very slow and hard to make decisions, but the trade off of that is very hard to change decisions. So once it's made a decision, you know roughly where you are in the medium term. Right, so the, my, the MAC report, which we just talked about, was the migrate, Migratory or Migration Advisory Committee. That's right. So they recommended the 30,000 uh, baseline limit, which is what non EU um, residents mm -hmm. of the UK that live, uh, are eligible to come here. And it's something that we covered with Jody when we did a podcast with Ashish because his argument has been that to get his. Um, Entry level staff, he, he's had to choose from a narrower and narrower um, group of people. I know, and we noticed Raffaello and I, who's our policy assistant at Fashion Roundtable, that they didn't pick up on this. Do you, do you think that that gives hope? Because not only was it uh, the fashion industry that would be up in arms with it, because it is those it seamstresses, it's the people assisting in a jewellery company, but it's also the conservative heartlands farm workers who are seasonal. So do you think that that gives any scope for a, a lobbying opportunity, Harry? Um, so I think it will be incredibly difficult um, if we were to transition to the system without any um, you know, exception being negotiated for the, for the EU. But that's what the government said. They want one, a one-world system in which everyone is treated the same. But the problem is that so far we've had it very simple, I, I would say. You know, if you're a EU citizen, you can come here. If, and the definition of a worker is fairly, fairly generous, I think. Um, 13 and a half hours a week, something around that. And from that point on, you're entitled to be treated equally to anyone else in, the, in this country. And then suddenly you imagine that going. And to be to work here permanently, you'll have to earn a minimum of thirty thousand uh, pounds for the creative industries. I mean, it's ludicrous. We're an incredibly talented sector, hugely highly skilled, but unfortunately not always very highly paid. Uh, we did some surveying before the Migration Advisory Committee report, and we found generally our members, uh, for most roles, it'd be around the twenty-five thousand, twenty-six thousand pound mark. So we have to artificially inflate salaries. If, and you know, cause harm to, to businesses if we were to try and maintain that flow for permanent migration. Mm -hmm. On the temporary side, I'd say it's perhaps a bit more optimistic in that the UK has said with the political declaration with the EU that we can potentially negotiate something around, say, 90, 90 days, hopefully, where people are building on the precedent of previous uh, creative agreements the EU's had with other third countries, that people can come and work freely. But, like I said previously, this can only happen if we agree a withdrawal first. Otherwise, there is no mobility framework, and we're stuck for temporary movement in terms of the current Tier 5 visa system. Um, so what is the Tier 5 visa system? So the Tier 5 system, it's a number of different aspects. The, so the simplest one, I'd say, permitted paid engagements, which I'm sure a number of you might have used. You can bring someone over for a month um, with a letter of invitation. Uh, a full Tier 5 creative visa, that could bring them up to 24 months if you renew at the 12 month stage. Um, um, but for that, you need a certificate of sponsorship. And then what's the one, I remember speaking to Sam, who's now at DCMS mm -hmm. from your team about this. What, is it Tier 2 or Tier 1, which is like the Nobel Peace Prize winner? <laughs> tier 1, yeah. Tier 1, mm -hmm. and, what, and what's the number of people that can get in on this uh, amazing this is, visa? This is uh, the exceptional talent or exceptional promises. I think it's about a thousand or so. Um, it's not very many. Uh, and so that's why we're calling for an additional route uh, within Tier 1 for freelancers. So a 24 month visa where, like the other Tier 1 visas, will have endorsing bodies, um, so perhaps Fashion Roundtable, perhaps BFI, British Fashion Council, people who have real expertise. The British Fashion Council have been made the um, auditors, if you like, of that visa, which for me is problematic because their focus is on designers, whereas our industry is a great mm. roster of talent who aren't all. I, I didn't work as a designer, I was an editor. Mm. So who then, who's then deciding and auditing that becomes problematic if you have 1,000 visas for the whole of the country, right? Mm. For all industries. So fashion, which has not had a big voice, is fighting for a percentage. And I think on average, the creative industries have had 12% of these 1,000 visas, which have just been doubled. Am I right? 
So I'm not sure on the actual figure of how much the creative industries have had, but it is a very small amount. And the tier one system is not an efficient way of bringing people over because of the, the high level of qualification that you have to meet. And so that's why you know, I agree with you to the sense that we really do need to hone in to different subsectors of the creative industries and different aspects of different subsectors within fashion to ensure that if we do create this new freelancers visa um, and have endorsing bodies there, that we have people who really know their sectors, yeah. who know who's qualified, who will be good for this country if we're taking their power away from the Home Office. Yeah. And what we advocate then is say a 24 month period of time where a freelancer can come, take up multiple contracts, which they currently can't even can't do through the tier two system, can do very difficultly through the tier five system. Um, and so would that be good for somebody who's come here as a student, wants to stay, wants to try and set up business? Um, well, so there's been some developments there. Um, so just I think early April we had the new start tier, tier one startup and innovator visas. Uh, the new tier one startups, so this is replacing the graduate entrepreneurship visa. And so you can have, uh, I think, and most nearly all the universities in the country have the endorsing power for that, along with a number of other trade bodies who been seen to be supporting entrepreneurship. And so they, they can go and say, well, if you're currently a student here on a tier four visa, you've got a great idea for a business, come and stay a bit longer for, I think it's a year or so, and see how you if you can develop that, that idea. But it's problematic because you, you don't suddenly stop being a student and start being an entrepreneur, no. entrepreneur when you graduate. And I think this is a real weakness of the system yeah. currently. Where's the link between the tier four student system yeah. and allowing people to start building their ideas? Yeah. Because, you know, you're allowed 20 hours a week during your student visa, but why waste that, you know, doing something you don't want to do it might be you know, a very local job and you've got a brilliant idea why not give students the opportunity to start working on those entrepreneurial ideas before they actually graduate yeah, no, so we're very much advocating on that okay thank you and then we have like, I have so many opinions on that but we can go on about that all day um, Shelley you've got a question haven't you yep. hi there from Sweet Pea as well um, so part of the business is wholesale the majority of it is but we also have retail um, outlet, and we were just wondering if we still get any tourists in London <laughs> once we leave, if we leave, um, would they be able to take advantage of that refund for any purchase they make? Um, and secondly, we've kind of touched on this, but um, part of our wholesale part of the business, we we buy we you know we buy supplies from all over the place and tariffs, import tariffs to do that, which we've kind of talked about a little bit. And that was it, really, how that would be affected ready-made jewellery as well as raw materials which we both both and also you do business with japan don't you so you've got concerns about yeah that was our, our last question so um i think catherine touched on that the epa agreement that's now in place which has started with with the eu and japan i mean a majority of our business is with japan and obviously this is a great thing for us to be part of is you know what will happen when we're gone will there be any kind of agreement like that with the uk afterwards Okay, so I'll start with Swati on those, and then we can go to Alison. So, I'll start with the VAT question. In principle, no, you won't actually be able to use the VAT form anymore. Only EU transactions are recorded under the VAT, according to the, according to Her Majesty's Revenue and Customs, and everything else is what is called exports and imports in this country. EU transactions are actually not even considered exports and imports in principle. So that is going to end unless there's a new agreement about that, otherwise it will cease to be. In terms of import tariffs, from what the UK has announced, I don't know specifically about jewellery, at the moment it's about say 5%, four and a half roughly. That probably is, my sense would be the new schedules are not, are going to keep that same tariff, they're not going to be any kind of um, checks, and they're not going to be any reductions on that. If you want to look at particular items, the UK actually has the Department of International Trade's website will give you what the projected tariffs will be under no deal versus this versus that. Broadly, do not expect costs to fall for the reason that between the exchange rate tanking, the trade costs coming in, that, that is going to be more expensive. In terms of what is unmet opportunities then, the Japan deal seems like the most obvious one which, you know, one of the least controversial trade agreements we have seen in the past many, many years for the reason you're talking about two really developed countries, high quality standards, going to be much easier to do trade, and the fact that, the, that Japan actually went back so much in terms of how much tariff cut, cuts that they gave to the European Union. I think that should possibly be replicable by the UK government. That's what they claim on, they claim 
you know, they claimed also that there wouldn't be any issues when they went to the WTO, there were complaints about that as well. So in principle, I think it should roll over the same kinds of commitments for the UK. But we're talking about so many different trade agreements to be negotiated. And let me give you an idea of how long these things take. After the Canada-US free trade agreement had been put in writing, they have gone through all that fighting about what concession we're going to give, what we're not going to do. It still took four years for it to come into being. And that's between Canada and the US. We're not talking about sort of really difficult trade partners here. So that is going to take a very long time, most likely. Right, thank you. She's got one, don't worry. <laughs> um, Alison. It's a more broader question about imports rather than tariffs in particular. Um, at the moment, some of you might know that you can stop items, infringing items or counterfeit items being brought into the EU with one form. Again, you'll then need two forms, so it's an added level, and there is a, 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 an official fee for each form. Um, and the reason that would change is because at the moment, if you put something on the market anywhere in the EU, um, you are deemed to have put it on the market everywhere in the EU, you can't stop anyone else from doing that. However, and that's within the EEA rather than just the EU. If we're not in the EEA, then it's another thing that we just don't know about. The UK government has said that their aim is that once um, a UK company puts something on the market anywhere in the EEA, it can be resold anywhere in the EEA without the UK owner needing to give consent. However, there isn't the opposite comfort. So if you... Um, it will only work the other way around if the EU or EEA agree. So if we have no agreement with them, if you put something for sale with your consent in the UK, there's nothing to stop someone from taking that and importing it into the EEA, and there would be not a lot you could do about it. Mm. So it's just another... That's really happy. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Enjoy. Um, Claire has a question. Oh, Claire. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so I'm just going to give a little bit of background. Uh, so I'm uh, ethical, uh, think of the word, um, ethical tailor uh, within business. Um, stop doing a standalone uh, brand as such uh, to sort of help with the impact of sustainability. Um, now, with the amount of pressure of climate change and with the urgent action needed for laws to reform the current negative output on the planet um, that you, that with the use of fossil fuels um, into a more natural and environmentally conscious system, and with only 11 years to do this, otherwise there will be extinction of our own breed, uh, why are we still talking about Brexit? Well, I'm afraid you have to talk about it, that's the problem, and as Simon said, it is the beginning of the beginning of the beginning, and I've, I've reached peak Brexit, I'm, you know, I've been to a lot of Brexit meetings, but the problem is, is unless we deal with this, in my opinion, yeah. we, you know, we, the EU laws are the most likely to, 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 to uh, is the most likely to deal with them. I don't, I wouldn't trust this no, I think it's incredibly tragic what's happened to this, this parliament. I mean, we've all caught, got caught up in this issue which didn't need to be fixed in, in the first place, right? I mean, we were doing just fine. The immigration system was working very well for us. Trade was working very well for us. Um, and we've got into this fantasy that we can escape our, our geographical location. I mean, it's a complete Hotel California situation that, you know, even if we tried to deregulate here, you know, and where would people choose to trade? I mean, there's hundreds of millions of people just across the channel in a single market, or they, they, they come to us here. So I, I don't think we are going to be able to get any benefit from this. And then, like you say, it begs the question, why are we focusing on the crucial issues that are affecting us and trying to stop and trying to solve something that doesn't need to be solved? Um, and I very much agree with what you were saying as well, that the EU is the best means by which we can achieve these kind of global agreements. Uh, we aren't the country we used to be, I guess. You know, we, we don't have the same clout, and we have to recognize that, that we will have more clout on the international stage, stage through organizations like the European Union, and thereby we can get the kind of cooperation we need to achieve uh, protections against future climate change. Um, the one saving grace in it, I guess, 
uh, is that, as, as, as Alison was saying earlier, that existing EU law does automatically roll over into UK law. Um, and so if there was a government, and hopefully there won't be, that will try and dismantle those protections that we have and those commitments, it would take them a considerably long time to do it because there's a lot of EU law that's going to roll over. Uh, you can have some of the is also trying to get Scotland back into the EU. If they leave, that's part of what will be her independence ploy. And she's a politician who's seen the sway of public opinion of people who want to talk about climate change. So if she adds that into the mix, she might get, what was it, that 45% back to 55%. So she's a politician. Yeah, no, that's fair enough. But it's just, you know, everyone's seen the So the EU has laws in place for modern day slavery, which are world leading, which if we leave and we don't keep to those laws, perhaps someone could pick up on some of this. But I mean, you know, the EU laws are the safeguard across all of these measures, and they are world leading. And if you want them to go further enough, but you're outside the it's going to be very hard to be heard, I think, which is... If the, if the problem is politicians in Westminster, then you can see their preoccupation with Brexit as a positive. Because at the moment, what they really only think about and work on, because of the situation, is, is Brexit. So that means that their attention isn't so much on those other issues. Now that comes with a huge opportunity cost. It's not just climate change, but it's across the range of public policies, a whole range of things that need attention, education, health, regional development, welfare. All of those things have been put on hold for the last few years. Now, where there is an opportunity is that the people who might have blocked action might be so distracted by Brexit that you might be able to mobilise opinion to change uh, what people think so that when they come back to a point where they can make decisions, you've changed the situation that they confront, which gives you more opportunity to get your things coming through. Now, that's the optimistic take, and clearly you see that there is a, a wave of mobilisation again uh, around climate change. It is a long-term issue. It requires not just European, but global cooperation. And those things are things which work as much through non-party political channels as they do through politicians doing their thing. So, you know, I think in all these things, and climate change I think is the most obvious example, the more you can try and mobilise make connections, you don't have to rely on Brexit or on the EU or <coughs> politicians doing things for you. You also can do things too. And that's really, I think, where there's the opportunity that whilst politicians are squabbling about something else, you can change the situation uh, and the incentives for them to, to do something about that. Yeah, we, and I read today that Michael Gove and um, Sadiq Khan have agreed to meet with Extension Rebellion. Rebellion. So, you know, that's definitely uh, goes to show what non-violent action has results of meeting with leadership who haven't even opened the door to them. Um, Claudio, who did, he is going to ask his question <laughs> He's over here. Where's the Hello. 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 He's got it already. I'm ready. He's ready for show business. <laughs> Hello, um, I'm a photographer's agent and I guess I sell services. So my question was, we touched up on tariffs earlier on. I'm wondering if services will fall onto the same system, if there is a system of tariffs in this fantasy world. Um, and also you wanted to ask, should you open a subsidiary inside the EU? Yeah. Will that help and would that be a clever idea to just maybe try and move some? Not that it's easier to do, but would it make more sense to be based in Europe going forward? So 
describe in an analysis. Also, because there's also the problem of visas. So my photographers might go to Paris or Milan or, or wherever for a shoot for one day, and it's impossible to think that they need to require a visa or that would even obtain a visa. So. The advantage of having a subsidiary is that you can avoid cross-border activity. You could uh, have uh, your subsidiary inside the EU and you could organise that work there on the basis that you have at the moment. The downside of that is clearly duplication of uh, staffing, of resourcing, of processes, and how you manage that is going to be a, a costly addition. Really, the decisions about things like having subsidiaries depend very much on the pattern of your work, how much you're moving across boundaries. Uh, it doesn't necessarily resolve all of the issues if you're trying to do work within your business. It, it won't necessarily resolve those issues that will come from the erection of new barriers to trade, whether that's on goods or services or people moving as well. So, all of those things need to be taken into consideration. It really it does depend on how your work is structured and whether the, the benefits that come with it, the certainties that come with it, are worth the additional cost, which are the establishment costs, but also ongoing uh, costs uh, that, that come with them. Alison? So I'm talking from a point of view of, of my business. We have had to um, open an office in another EU country uh, because we will no longer be able to practice before the EU Intellectual Property Office can Brexit. Um, and that's because of the complicated system that we have for our um, qualifications, but I'm assuming it will happen to a lot of other professions uh, too, which is um, that not only do we have to be qualified in an EU country, we have to be a national and resident there. So even if I took new qualifications, I don't have EU nationality uh, and I, I don't particularly want to move, although that would be a possibility. Um, but um, the problem that I have with it, which I think will be replicated in, in many other businesses, is that we then lose the attractiveness of coming to the UK, any business coming to the UK, because I can't practice in Europe anymore but all EU attorneys can still practice in the UK because the UK government doesn't want to put up any barriers to trade. Mm. So any non-EU uh, business, U, uh, US, J Japanese, any non-EU business will probably take their work to uh, an attorney in France or Germany and then they will file the UK, they'll do the EU and the UK as a package. Um, so we have looked to do a subsidiary because we have no choice. Yeah. Quite how it will pan out again, we don't know, but it's the same on, on every level. Um, so, that, so that also has an impact because a lot of brands, um, they do their soft launch into Europe in the UK. So if this rigmarole and reputation is damaged, then Paris or uh, Amsterdam looks more attractive. Yes, yeah, if it's easier and you're going to a bigger market, why yeah. wouldn't you go there? Yeah. Okay. But there's another issue, which is that if you're leaving staff out of the UK, out of London, there are fewer people here who are part of that ecosystem. So one of the attractions is you have a great community, a great network that's there, but the people you need are nearby. If more of those people are moving out, that reduces the attraction of London as a location, which then gives you more incentive to leave, which yeah. perpetuates issues. So there are going to be uh, community costs as well as ones directly for your own business. Thank you. Right, and then we've got a question which is very close to my heart from Jody, who my friend is now dashing over to. <laughs> what we're going to do, guys, is we're just going to hammer through these questions and then and then we can take a bit of a break because otherwise it was just like we were going to end and it would just seem a bit silly. So, Jody, your question is... Mine's really just picking up on the um, Modern Slavery Act a little bit, um, and also to do with gender equality, female rights, that kind of thing. You know, as a as a mother of a one-year-old and a three-year-old, a business owner, um, thinking about pensions, thinking about you know our gender pay gap, turning off our out of office in November. How how is Brexit going to affect women's rights and yeah, female business owners? Um, in principle, at the moment, the way things are, the government has said that they're going to abide by the working time directives, which are many of these things which guarantee workers certain rights. 
it will be rolled over after, which is what Alison had mentioned earlier, the moment this is, we've adopted EU law into our law, but that's not to say that that's the law that's going to remain in principle, that's a transition phase. So these could come under sort of some possible attack. And the reason I say that actually is not sort of lightly, it's the same kind of issue which happened with the climate change and renewable energy directives, that if you look at the reports which say that the EU is, you know, this absolutely bureaucratic, big, you know, giant and we need to get rid of all these onerous regulations that come with being in, being part of the European Union, of course, there are going to be some within those which are things like, yes, bananas shouldn't, you know, we don't care if they're shaped in a particular way, but others are things like working time directives, renewable energy strategy, climate change directives, and these are basically what in all of these reports are singled out as the really onerous costs of being members of the EU. These are the regulatory costs. 50% of the regulatory costs that you read about in the papers are precisely this. So whether these are just something which we're going to keep and continue to keep, or whether these are things that later are going to be sort of whittled down, it's a bit hard to say. Do you see a potential damage to women's rights? Um, I see very little progress. That's more the problem. And Actually, and I'm going to speak a little bit about economics because recently it was, I mean, it was part of the New York Times cover story and Me Too as well, which is that there have been extremely sort of well-known, prestigious people who've come under allegations now. The biggest issue that, we've, that we face whenever this question comes up, why aren't there women in economics? And if there are women in economics, they tend to be doing very, very sort of superfluous compared, compared to sort of the mainstream economics that you see. One of the issues we face is that if you know if you were to let it go, things that okay, you know, we think progress is being made, and now if you look at the undergraduate economics courses, there seem to be about you know 30 to 50 percent women in many many of them. So maybe things are changing, and we don't need to do anything. If you actually calculate how long it would take to get to parity level, we're talking about 150 years or so. Mm -hmm. So. That's what worries me. It's not as though things aren't changing. It's that they're changing so slow. And the gender pay gap in, in certain companies earlier, a, a couple of months ago, was, yes. was proven to be going backwards. So one of the main reasons that happens, two couple of reasons, most of them are not actually things that you can sort of pick apart as saying these were these women are qualified, while these aren't. And you know, if, if it was some kind of segregation based on qualifications, you wouldn't have a problem. It's all of this soft money that comes in, which is you know things like. We, you, you might call them bonuses, you might call them that we as women don't look as actively for jobs outside while the man will come with a fat sort of competing paycheck and that's not happening. Now Norway has tried to do some of these things which is by trying to have women on boards and trying to do this through the, no, the Norwegian Sovereign Wealth Fund. There is some progress, but we're talking about a society which already is much further ahead in many of these things than, say, the UK. So I just, I, I don't see any progress. I'm really kind of no, pessimistic about yeah. it. Yeah. Uh, I, can I just add yeah. one thing? I think it's absolutely unbelievable that childcare for working women isn't tax deductible. I just think this is, you know, I mean, I know somebody who's a lawyer and she earns 60 grand a year and she earns 40 grand on childcare. It's not tax deductible, it's not for work, working. This is a huge obstacle for women getting into work, is that when they look at the cost of childcare, it kind of cancels out the money that they'd earned, and yet there was a recent report that showed that women, you know, w women in work can bring a huge amount to the exchequer. And I see the tax deductible or non-tax deductible childcare is a huge obstacle. I mean, we've got all this Me Too, which, you know, wherever you think it's gone, it's a good thing, but then it's a bit excessive. But one of the huge kind of elephants in the room, dinosaurs in the room, is this childcare issue. That it should be so I, I think he uh, did, a, did a report that I looked into, and it would be cost neutral if if childcare was free because of the amount of money, I believe it's 150 billion that, child, that female uh, work would bring into the UK economy, plus the fact that a woman who has a child is statistically unlikely to ever reach the earning potential of, of a woman on the same career trajectory uh, without a child. So this is, this is bigger than the EU, but I would... 
I believe it's 150 billion. I know it's on our social media if you'd like to go through our online history. Um, Sally did a great design for us. I believe it's 150 that it would bring back into the UK economy. I personally don't see any positives in terms of gender parity coming from uh, a certain, certain voices of leadership contestants for the Tory government in terms of what they believe would be potential impacts. So you have a potential leader in um, Boris Johnson, who is on quote for saying that women go to university to find a man to marry. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, ask yourself what you think of that. Mm -hmm. How is there anything you want to add to that? Um, move I think the only thing I'd add is looking at the impact of Brexit in this. Um, the one thing to remember is that the Council of Europe is not part of the European Union, it's a separate institution, and so um, the Human Rights Act 1998 here is, will stay on our statute books and will not be affected by Brexit as such, so people can still bring cases if they feel the human rights have been breached to the European Court of Human Rights. I mean, I know the Sun and the Daily Mail might like to conflate the two, but it's a separate institution, and the idea of a British Bill of Rights has been quite thoroughly quashed so far in our Parliament, I don't think we'll get through in this session. Thank you. Fiona. Hi. Oh, Highland. Thank you. Lowland. Exile. Scotland voted Remain the same way that London did. If we go ahead and Brexit actually happens, how likely is it that um, Scotland might be able to, sorry, if Scotland does then win an independence referendum in the future, what would that mean for potential Scottish EU re-entry? And, okay, and what's living, like, what does it mean for Scottish university fees? Scotland's got them paying for the first degrees. Harry. So I think in, in terms of Scotland's re entry, I think the EU would very much welcome it, but I think it would be. Um, I mean, it wouldn't be too challenging for Scotland to rejoin because they would meet the EU's criteria in many ways. You know, they're already following the EU's laws by being part of the UK. They wouldn't be the, the successor state, though, to the UK. Um, as a smaller ch chunk, um, it would have to reapply on its own accord to the EU and therefore would be subject to new EU rules, such as uh, joining the Euro, which the UK was able to opt out from. Um, and so it would be tricky. Um, it would have to be inside Schengen, I imagine. Yeah, which is then have an implication for the UK. The UK border would have another hard border crisis between the UK and Scotland. Um, <laughs> On the tuition fee point, um, so I think it actually might help keep, for Scottish students at least, it might help keep tuition fees full, um, just in the sense that currently, um, so because of the non-discrimination principle, you can't discriminate against EU students coming here. You, if you're offering Scottish students free tuition, they have to offer EU students free tuition. First Brexit, we could charge EU students whatever we liked, and I imagine a lot of the universities perhaps regretfully will start to do that, but the income from that can then start to subsidise Scottish students and you wouldn't have the, what I feel is a slightly perverse situation of English students having to pay full fees in Scotland, but Scottish and EU students not having to do so. Yeah, thank you. Um, Pavel has a question, he's over here. Hi, um, so as a creative working in the fashion industry, I often travel to Paris and Milan, and of course, data in my phone is quite crucial for my job. Um, first of all, how likely are we to go to a no deal? And if so, who owns the data as GDPR is EU-based? And then, of course, how much more will my phone calls cost inside Roman charges when I travel um, inside mainland Europe? Alison. <laughs> So GDPR, whilst it was started by the EU, it's another law that's been already enshrined into UK law with the um, Data Protection Act in 2018. So the GDPR aspect won't change, at least initially. It is another law that could then change if politicians decided they wanted to take it away from the EU model, but initially it won't change at all. In terms of um, charges, the EU rules of it being free stay in force until the end of the transition period, or Brexit, if we don't have a, a transition period. If there isn't a deal, it's going to be up to the different mobile companies. Uh, there is some thought that the government might limit it to £45 a month per person, which would be 
better than the 500 pounds that some people may have incurred in the past. Um, but in future, it will just depend on whatever trade deal we have with the EU, and then which, if we have a good trade deal, that might include uh, revoking or limiting charges, but it's just all up for, up for grabs. So it's still up in the air on that one, because I, I was that person that got a 500 pound phone bill on the day I was on a video job that was earning me 500 pounds, and I realised I was now cost neutral. <laughs> so I've been that person. Um, we were having go back to those all many French phones that no one could remember the digits for because they kept running out. So, okay, so that's still up in the air, so that's something that people are probably lobbying on. I would imagine so, but it's going to that will be a market driven thing. So obviously it'll be the mobile phone companies that decide whether or not it's worth charging UK uh, <laughs> uh, individuals okay. to pay for it. Okay, right. They want to make most of our probably European owned companies. Yeah. Then. Yeah, okay. That's uh, so we've just got two more questions before we open this out and then we have a drink. Um, so Raffaella is going to ask a question over okay. there. Hi, so I was wondering, as a dual nationality, Italian Brazilian, um, how safe is it for me to stay in the UK? So kind of what laws do I have to be aware of? Um, could these laws change living in a situation like that of the Windrush generation, for example? Um, what paperwork, paperwork should I be aware of? And will there be more red tape for me to fill out? Simon. Yes, there will be more paperwork. Um, I've got an answer to a question. <laughs> I think one of the things that we learned from the Windrush uh, situation is the, the problems that, that uh, occurred there was that the system is complex uh, and is tending towards more complexity and certainly for EU nationals there will be a whole period of uncertainty because there will be cut off dates about when people have come in, uh, which ones are in your situation, but uh, there will be people who haven't applied for settled status by the end of uh, the period that the UK has uh, required people to do that by. There will be uneven uh, enforcement of uh, the whatever regime there is that comes into effect because the government won't have the capacity to deal with everyone in any timely fashion, uh, even if it uh, puts that as a priority issue. So I think the simple answer again is, it's been like the other previous answer I've given before, is that there will be uncertainty. Uh, and I think for, for you and for other EU nationals here in the UK, that uncertainty will extend for quite some considerable period of time. The thing that might count in your favour is that there are an awful lot of EU nationals in the UK, and that tends to push the government towards policy choices that it at least can pretend are enforceable. That if it puts in place a very draconian system, one with a lot of limits and restrictions, uh, if it can't enforce that, or if the economy would uh, suffer very substantial uh, problems, that, that obviously is, a, is an issue. So that would tend to push towards a, a simpler system. And you, you see an element of that with the Settled States program, which is, oh, I don't know if you tried it, I, I had to do it with my mother, who's French, and uh, I, yeah. I spent a weekend doing it. Yeah. Uh, and I was determined to do it because uh, if I can't do it, nobody could do it. Uh, it's still not an easy system to, to navigate, but it's much simpler than uh, the other routes that currently exist for uh, nationals to regularise the, the situation in the UK. So there will be uh, things to keep uh, an eye on. Uh, I think the most important thing is to uh, ensure that you follow what government guidance there is as it comes out. Uh, and that you uh, make sure that you've got your paperwork uh, in a place where you can access it relatively easily. Uh, and I, I think at that stage, that's probably the most you can do. Uh, and uh, some people will be along with the problem at some point uh, in the future. Uh, the problem is that it won't be clear what the problem is until it turns out that it was a problem all along. Yeah, I get that because if we look at the Windrush generation issue, that, that I always. To me, these people were British, 
they thought they were British, and then the way they've been treated has been utterly disgusting, um, and still not really resolved satisfactorily. So that's the problem, I think, for people who believe that they have the right to stay here. In a generation's time, that could be questioned. And I, I think the, the other issue is going to be, it's not just about what the government does, it's what about uh, businesses, organisations do, that if they have requirements that they're supposed to fulfil, if they're not fulfilling those properly, that might create issues as well in terms of uh, banks or insurance or pensions. Um, uh, so uh, you know, that all those things might become problematic. Um, so uh, any system is imperfect in public policy. Yeah. Uh, the question is, how imperfect is it, and what will the government of the day do when it discovers the imperfection? Um, and uh, I think as Windrush has reminded us, those uh, imperfections can be huge uh, and can have really quite uh, catastrophic effects. Yeah. The, Harry, because the last question I realise we've covered already, so after this we're going to open up to you guys. Um, just on the EU settlement scheme, I, I would say that it is something that we should be proud of um, to, to, to an extent because of, you know, the government and the EU have said regardless of deal or no deal, we will protect the rights of EU citizens here and UK citizens in the EU. There will be no need to move, there will be no need for people who are currently working to stop working, um, we will have that continuation. Uh, and people, if, even in the event of a no deal, um, people will have until the end of 2020 to apply for this. It, I haven't tried the system myself, so it might be slightly complicated, but I do know there's an Android app for it, um, which is quite revolutionary for the Home Office to be trying new technology. Um, and if we do get a deal, we'll have until the end of June 2021 um, to apply for the, for the EU settlement scheme. So I think there are some positives to be taken away from there. Hands up who's, who's um, European and done their application. <laughs> Have you? One. <laughs> and you, didn't you do yours, Raphael? No. Uh, I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> Who here is an EU resident? Uh, and one of you's done it. Okay, so that's about 10%. Right, has anyone got any questions? Right, I know you've been burning to have <laughs> <laughs> So we've got two questions, yeah. So, so you guys can't not, um, <laughs> you guys covered um, the how to protect yourself if you're selling a product, but what about buying services? How do we protect our artists, artists with the global racing global effect? And how do we protect the company as a peer of services company as well? With the, before the, you know, if it doesn't happen. In terms of trademark protection, that covers services as well. Yeah. So you would protect yourselves as a business, and your when you file it, if those that do already know, sorry, uh, when you file a trademark application, you specify one or forty-five classes of goods or services, and that includes uh, creative services in, in one of those classes. So in terms of protecting your brand, um, then uh, then that's completely doable. The point about, and it goes back a little bit to the sustainable point as well, and about the. Um, the Made in Britain point, I think it's going to be a real challenge, and hopefully the government will help, but there's no guarantee of that, to, if we do leave the EU, the British, what it means to be British in any area, but particularly in the fashion realm, will need to be defined by the people in it, and then if you're promoting that and it's business that comes from or is in or works in Britain, that can be part of your, your brand your brand definition, and you build, you know, and the value of that will attach to your company name as being a British brand. On the other hand, if you'd rather be a European brand, uh, then you're going to need to protect, protect yourselves in the in the UK and the EU, and you, your offering will be more European based. Um, it remains to be seen which will be the the um, more popular, more more relevant for the fashion industry. How um, so the only thing I, I'd add to that is that uh, there is still the hope, I guess, that if we do get to future relationship negotiations, we can agree something on services. Um, so I know the government has said that they wouldn't want as close a relationship on services as they do for goods, but I don't think they'll be able to separate uh, in, 
economy in that sense. Like the, the EU said, you know, the four freedoms, trading, goods, services, capital, and movement of people, it comes as a package and you can't pick and choose in, in, in that sense. Um, so for instance, we joined a, a campaign called Free Move Create because it just seemed completely uh, sensible to me to join up with other creatives. So the music, um, the Incorporated Society of Musicians, I had an email from them today, are who are running that campaign because they're arguing for their for, for roadies and for musicians and it seems sensible to me to align ourselves with those people because they had already organised. Um, and what they're trying to get through is a multiple entry visa, two years, £20 for creatives. So this is something that we've got behind, but it is, uh, you know, it's going to then be up to definition, isn't it, of who's a create, you know, so there's all this red tape that we're trying to circumvent because the, uh, the withdrawal agreement as I read it from Theresa May was, was about goods rather than services, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. I think so, I think that's the, the government's priority, but I don't think they'll be able to achieve that. I understood we're a service industry company. <laughs> <laughs> um, and hopefully we'll be able to get protections in place for recognition of qualifications. It's a big thing for services and uh, mutual recognition of data protection yeah. uh, as well to enable trade for, for digital services. Yeah, so the more people that sign up to campaigns such as Free Move Create, it's hashtag Free Move Create or one word, I would really recommend you getting behind that because we've been... We've, we signed us up, Sarah Moe, and then we've got the BSC to sign up to it. And, and, and if, you, if you also, I don't want to be your advert, Creative Industries Federation, do you create a lobby for all of the creative sector. So by aligning ourselves with that, we um, are quite often the only fashion people in the room. Um, but it just allows a voice for all of the industry because a lot of the issues that politicians had heard about when I met with them, such as Hillary Benn, knew that opera singers had this, but wasn't aware of the fashion industry, but it made them think of it. And then when you say the figures of how much you earn compared to, say, an opera singer or how much the business earns, then it, it gives it food for thought. Mm. But, I mean, definitely, the services argument, yeah. I think, is up for debate. It definitely gives it more, more weight in terms of uh, migration and mobility. If, rather than that, I guess that's why we try and exist as a Creative Industries Federation, as a, a sector-wide body across, across all the different subjects. Is because if we can say, you know, it's not just one particular subject that's having this issue, but we're all experiencing it, we're all going to be really vulnerable if we can't have our talent of people coming over from the EU. Right, because a stylist is booked based on their talent, right? I was a stylist, so I get this. And the opera singer has to know the opera song. So they can't just say, right, well, we're going to get that guy from over there. You have to know the song, and it's the same for a stylist. They want to book you based on your talent. They don't want to book you based on the fact that you happen to live in Isleworth or Harrow. They want to be able to book you because you're good enough for the job. And that's where the argument, I think, yeah. about this freedom really mm -hmm. has to take place. So we really hope we can have something in the new visa system for this temple yeah. movement. I don't understand what people can beat, because I think that's my role <laughs> in life. Um, oh, sorry. It's, worth, it's worth noting that fashion has a particular situation, but there are lots of other se sectors that have particular situations. And just to think about one down the road, the city, financial services is a huge part of the British economy. And the success that financial services have had on changing government policy has been zero. That uh, the government took a position very early on that if it, it couldn't, it couldn't uh, make an exception for one sector because then you had to make an exception for every sector. And it was easier just to not listen to uh, lobbying. That's changing a bit now. But so far, in terms of changes to free movement, the government has been really inflexible. Uh, and I would say probably as a rule of thumb, this government is not going to change its yeah. mind about that. And what about with the different political different, different parties are available, <laughs> which may have different policies, but uh, on the basis of you know, uh, British politics these days, no one knows what might, uh, a different government might do. But I think one of the, the few certainties so far in Brexit has been that this particular government has not been amenable to uh, carving out exemptions for particular sectors. Yeah. So it, it would have to be a wholesale change of policy, which at the moment isn't going to happen, but then I haven't checked Twitter in the last hour and a half, so... <laughs> and then this lady had a question, and then Roxy's got a question, and then we'll... Uh, well, oh, do you want that? You don't do you, No, it's okay. I can move. Maybe at the back there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll get 
can I can be loud. Um, well, we can uh, ask Mr. Rodrigo for the last three months. Uh, I thought nonsense cannot be in a higher degree, but then Ukrainian election committee to be their president, and I can write the <laughs> uh, the best ones. Um, he uh, might be great, though. <laughs> he might be great. Uh, no, definitely. <laughs> um, well, uh, I know him personally. Uh, the thing is that uh, my business may be the most uh, suffering one because uh, we are uh, we have a, we we so um, so uh, so uh, my English his language. Well, so all our materials and trimmings are from Europe. Uh, we made everything in Europe. And uh, the brand is British, and it's very English because we create Mary Poppins carpet bags. Okay. And uh, uh, when I started my business five years ago, I, I, I had no idea that somebody would stupidly want to, <laughs> to get out of Europe. And because so where's your taxation? Your taxation is it's, it's like everything, everything comes from more. I don't pay, I don't pay me everything from I sell. Because I, I don't have wholesale, I do only uh, retail online. So I pay me everything that I sell to and, and consumers in England and in Europe. I don't pay me to obviously to my American, Australian, Japanese buyers and blah blah blah. So uh, yeah, the bad part is that I pay me tea on our, our, my retail sale to Europe. It's like considered, but that is minimum. Right. I'm just, I'm just, I don't know what to do next because I ordered twice more bags half a year before I need them, and I received them seven days before our, our, our first Brexit. And uh, uh, now I feel absolutely stupid because I <laughs> So you did contingency planning, which cost you more. Oh, yes, but I thought I would have And you're worried about having to do that again, which would be damaging to your profit share. Yeah? Because I, I'm, I'm all in Europe. Maybe I should open uh, my business in Europe. Yeah. Maybe, I don't know what to what, what next because I... Uh, I can't so I think I think the question is because we've covered the subsidiary question. I think the question for Alison and Spotty is, if you if, if we have more confusion and more an idea and more people having to buy in advance. I know this has been across the board for lots of industry for lots of sectors: the food industry, the pharmaceutical industry. What does that mean for for a brand who's headquartered here? It's not really. It's not really a brand issue, it is a, a tax and a revenue and a, and a, and a sales issue. Um, I think it's probably going to be more spotty that can answer okay. this than me. Have, you, have your sales been affected by Brexit in any no. way? No. But because you see, again, it's it's very British people, uh, my main market in America, Australia, yeah. you know, uh, Malaysia, whatever. So it's a global market. Yeah, Europe is minimal. Right. Can I only try to make you feel better and say you're not alone? <laughs> UK up to an FDI, which is how much money do businesses invest from the UK elsewhere, has really gone up since the referendum. Inward FDI, which is how much are people investing in the UK, has really gone down. And much lower, not just like this is not some general trend that's happening in the British in sort of any economy. This is happening only in the British economy, much more severely in the British economy than anywhere else in the OECD. So what is the government? Sorry, the Organization of Economic Cooperation and Development, which is basically in your head you should think developed countries, basically. Rich okay. countries. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And this is already happening. We know that's happening. We know costs are going up. We know it's already translated into wage reductions. I don't have better news to give. This is typically what happens when there's economic uncertainty and the ones that suffer the most in most time periods of economic uncertainty are typically small businesses because they're the first ones who are going to see credit being slashed back. They're the first ones who are going to have to deal with sort of less hedging that they have done than before compared to big businesses. I'm really sorry to hear it, but that's just sort of, it's not something sort of, don't think that it's you particularly or there's something no, you're no, doing sorry, wrong. It's just, but I'm just, I'm just, what next? I wouldn't open a uh, business in Bulgaria because it's the cheapest, because I do have a friend who opened a business in Bulgaria just because they do everything in Europe, well, 90% in Bulgaria, 90% here in Europe. I think that's the unknown, yeah, isn't it? It's because the seamstresses are reportedly going back to Lithuania, and the, you know, if it's difficult for 
your product to get in and out because of tariffs or it's a delay or it's a cost at each point of those, of those components that are coming in and out. Plus you're manufacturing in Europe, right? Yeah. Yeah, so you're not even waiting for it to get to your to a factory. Yeah, I, just, I just get end to end for it. So Belgian carpers, German trimmings, right. Bulgaria manufacturing, then everything, I buy everything, pay to everyone. Everybody send everything to Bulgaria, they make it, send it to me and I sell it. Globally, right. So I think those subsidiary questions really pick up on that. I know we've got Roxy's question, I know you've got a question, and then I, I think people have hit fatigue and need a drink. So, Roxy, are you going to use the mic? He's our host of us. Thank you very much, by the way, Roxy. Thank you. Welcome to Sunday. Uh, yeah, mine was. Mine was, let's, let's say all of us have heard what you have to say and we've decided this doesn't sound quite so sweet. What, what would be the one takeaway that you guys would all say, go do this, to either prevent this from happening or make us uh, as safe as possible working within the fashion industry? So obviously you know that there are e MEP elections coming up, uh, which Catherine touched on. Perhaps Catherine, you'd like to... So you're, you're asking that question as well, aren't you, about tactical voting? Yeah, how should we vote is the big question. Do we blackmail Labour and say if they put a second referendum on the table with Remain as one of the two options, we'll actually vote for them in the European election? I mean, somebody said the only thing that changes politicians' behaviour is something that threatens their ability to be re-elected. So Labour have been, we could threaten them. I mean, I'm scared of, you know, we've talked, you know, even during the Thatcher's tenure, we're talking about voting tactically, whether we should vote tactically or threaten our, basically, go for them, threaten Labour, we won't vote for them next time unless they put, you know, second referendum on the table and remain as an option. Um, but, you know, we will vote for them if they do, because, I mean, it strikes me they just need a little push to push them into that. Um, so many of the, the members are leaving or on the point of leaving because they're so disgusted. They must be aware of that, that this could be a tactic that we could apply. And this... So, just to sort of, I thought I should comment, I, I work for the Labour Party. Um, so I, I thought I recognised you. <laughs> uh, it's really good to be here and listen and, and hear all the thoughts. This is, none of this is new to me. And also, uh, a lot of your uh, MEP Labour candidates are outwardly completely against Brexit. And in that regard, there is a bit of a, I think it's not in this season, there's a bit of a tussle within the Labour Party with the, the European elected officials. Mm -hmm. and, and of the leadership and, and, and other parts of the party. Um, in terms of a practical thing you can do, tomorrow the National Executive Committee of the Labour Party pulls its manifesto out. So in that will be the wording on what we're going to do on Brexit. I would urge everyone in this room to go away and email every single member of the NEC tonight. And so where would they be able to find their data? So that's on the Labour Party website. Um, and I've got the link, maybe I'll send it to you and then you can go up. Um, they do just need a nudge. I feel like we're almost there in terms of getting confirmatory referendum. You can't call it people's vote in Labour, I'm afraid, for various reasons. <laughs> a confirmatory referendum is almost there. And I think if we put it back to the country, that across so many sectors, these discussions have been going on. And where are the unions at with it? Because uh, from what I read just before we started, the unions were coming out in favour of a, of a referendum. The unions have come out. Many, many of the major unions have come out. Some, one or two of the major ones have, but most of them have come out mm. um, for the second referendum. They've been very clear at the beginning. There is so within the Labour Party, that would hold sway because they swear. Because they because come out and them up. acknowledge that there is no such thing as a jobs first Brexit. Yeah. So Labour can say that, but I work for them, so I'm going to be in trouble now. But there is, they can say that all the like, there is no such thing, yeah. and the unions know it. Yeah. Put pressure on tonight, tonight. Yeah. The manifesto gets drafted, final draft tomorrow morning, and it's out. So I'm going to send them it's on the Labour Party website, the NEC. What, what, is, what is the Labour Party's name of your organisation? 
UK, is it? So, labor.org.uk. <laughs> yeah, I knew it. Labor.org.uk. And members of the NEC, and this is all of them. The National Executive NEC. Committee. So, I'm aware of, and then we've got this gentleman's question, and then we're going to have drinks. So, do you need this spot? No, I don't. Um, as an incurable optimist, I don't believe everything is always doom and gloom. Um, if you were to give us worst case scenario, what are, what are the opportunities or what are the, the positives that worst case scenario happened? Or obviously, if it stays the way it is, then we just it's business as usual, right? For example, somebody talked about cost of of, of um, things we use being more expensive way importing them. So I see that as an opportunity. That means that internally the UK will be cheaper, right? That's how I see it. I think that the glass is always half full. So as your 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 experts in the industry, what three things would you so say? So are you talking about if we became a free a, a, what's it called? A free <laughs> free market economy where we yes. yeah so. so that I think is by far the most dangerous proposal out there. The countries which are free market economies like these, like what, what is sort of in quotes are things like Singapore, which have really low taxes, they're mostly typically city states. They are not trying to give benefits and a sort of basic livelihood to people, which are sort of the numbers that we're talking about here. There's a second really big problem that somehow, I mean, I'm totally with you. I really want to give a positive message. I'll end with one, which is very quickly when I said, yes, the cost of imports is going up. And you might think, well, that's great, actually. The, uh, the pound fell. We should have seen our export business booming. Did not happen. The nature of the world economy is not as simple as that. It isn't a matter of simply that... You know, if the pound falls, we can start exporting, our goods become cheaper. We also rely on some very crucial inputs from abroad. And which way that balance goes, it's not something which is sort of set in stone. It just is a matter of empirically what's true and the, what kind of business are we talking about. So I want to send in with one really positive note since you're saying don't say doom and gloom. <laughs> there is one thing Britain can do, which is up till now, the trade agreements that exist, the kinds of economic policies that exist, which, including the EU that has supported them and the WTO, are really much further behind in terms of what we could sort of lobby for and ask that at the international stage, those are the things that should have been adopted. Whether we do it through the EU, we do it alone. That's a different matter, that you know, developing countries should get some kind of positives from us, so on and so forth. We can do all those things, but you don't have to necessarily Brexit to do them. You can use the clout of the European Union to do them. Blame the BBC. What were they doing? <laughs> because they're, they're being told that these tax terms are a little sick word. What are they working on? They're not, they don't get all the main people getting information to bring it down here. There's nothing about the police or something or something like that. So we can't blame people for voting because a lot of them do with that. Well, nobody knew. Do. The politicians didn't know. Yeah, but I think if you marginalise people to this extent, then we shouldn't necessarily expect the most informed voting either. No, there are a whole section of people who feel marginalised who want to say "fuck you." Yeah. They do it with their vote. That's it. Exactly. And that's even you know, that's what. Um, so that's a whole big yeah. ethical debate about what is democracy. Yeah. If democracy is if democracy is giving if giving people a vote and you haven't given them any political education. I come from an estate that's not very far from here where people voted to leave. They're going why you know, they they're coming out for Tommy Robinson. Um, and you know, they have, they have a vote. And they have they feel overlooked, the estate's being locked down. Grenville happened what half a mile away from here, a similar situation of being left behind and disregarded has happened nationwide. But, the, but to, to blame the EU for those issues is, is a mixing of the metaphors to such a degree, you know, and it's very troubling. I think the point that Harry brought on about identity politics has just become 
the, the, the biggest issue around Brexit is, is identity, because everybody now is aware of their identity, whether it's racial, whether it's religious, and, and you know, the, the, the levels of conversations coming out, unfortunately, with social media have heightened it, being trolled if you're a woman of agency, if you're a woman with, uh, of colour, if you are marginalised, is, is heightened. And it's the world west on our, on our, on our, and so people are getting information. You know, people are being targeted on Facebook with false narratives before the vote. They're being targeted for their votes. They're being targeted by the Brexit party now. I'm sure other parties are doing it. We think we're getting the news, and because of the algorithm, we're getting news results that are targeted to us. They know what we want to hear. So this is the issue. It's not even the papers anymore. It's on our phones. It's got bigger than that. The flip fashion industry but in the 80s it was a million you've got brands such as Mika's which is Paradise Row who are making a manufacturing in East London leather manufacturing my cousin worked in leather manufacturing until 10 years ago in uh, in West London in East London and, and it was sold out and everyone went to China in one season in leather so you know it's not an uncommon story but we do need to wrap up I just wanted to say two things on Wednesday, we've got a parliamentary meeting of the all-party parliamentary group for textiles and fashion, which is such a long phrase, but anyway, we're the secretariat for it. It's going to be on um, small business, online and high street retail. You're very welcome to attend. Raffaella, put your hand up if you'd like to join us. We've got the uh, British Retail Consortium, the Federation of Small Businesses, the Think Tank um, Centre for Towns. Um, and we've got Francis Card, who's one of our advisors, and Bev Malik, who's our retail director, speaking. That's at 1.30 to 3 at the Houses of Parliament on the 1st of May. We're also going to launch our membership scheme. If you're also interested in that, that will get you early bird tickets. This is probably going to be our last Brexit event for a long time, um, until we get closer to knowing where the hell we're going. But we are going to be doing other events um, through the year. Um, Raffaella can also... Um, speak to you if you'd like to sign up to that. I want to say thank you to Sunbeam. I know you want to say something, so we can come to that after. There's going to be drinks at the bar, but thank you to all our speakers. Thank you to Catherine, Swati, Harry, um, Alison, <laughs> Simon, and um, Lucy, who's got stuff in the